Hi everyone, and welcome to this four-part series where we will discuss robotic design in relation to concepting in digital 3D space. We're going to discuss a variety of concepts around the topic, making heavy use of Blender to demonstrate the various ideas. In this video, we're going to be focusing more on the important ideas and theory, then in videos 2, 3 and 4, we're going to be doing more practical modeling for different purposes. The concepts discussed in this series are certainly not exclusive to Blender, but this is my software of choice, so that's what we're going to be using. If you want to pick up the resources for this series, you can get them on my ArtStation store page, and that includes all of the model files and all of the blend files, and any support will be highly appreciated. Now, just for a disclaimer, this series is not focused on rigging or animation or any type of kinematic simulation, although we may briefly touch on those subjects. It is, however, focused on design and concepting. If there was a demand to go into any of those other subjects further, then that can always be done. So with that being said, let's begin. To start with, we need to talk about form versus function, which is something that's come up in previous tutorial videos, specifically the Sci-Fi Corridor series. In regards to robotics, engineering for robotic systems is quite specialized and requires a careful consideration of the laws of physics to construct a hardware and software environment that works in unison. The hardware provides the physical body for the system, whereas the software is often comprised of accessibility interfaces on top of a computational layer which contains algorithms specifically designed to resolve paths of motion, whilst ensuring that all joints and axes on the robot are working within their limits. The term we usually use for this kind of logic is called inverse kinematics, and it's something that's not exclusively taken advantage of for robotic systems. For example, game engines with advanced functionality for physics-based armatures will make use of inverse kinematics or IAK solutions to push the interactions of their characters with the world past the limitations of traditional animations. So how does this relate to form versus function? Well, artistic concept designers aren't always experts in robotic engineering, in the same way that science fiction writers aren't always experts in the laws of physics. But here's the thing, they don't need to be. For example, if a 3D artist is creating some kind of robotic android for a video game, they don't need to worry too much about making it hyper-realistic in terms of functionality. Sure, they can make the job easier for animators by putting things like ball joints on all of the limbs, but for most robotic video game NPCs, the method of animation could break the laws of physics anyway by twisting and stretching the metal in strange ways due to armatures and vertex weights. Of course, it all depends on the method of rigging and animation being used. Some developers are very strict about the angular motion of the hard surface objects in their games, quite often when it's the focal point of the experience, such as the tanks in World of Tanks. But just for an example of shortcutting realism for the sake of stylization, let's take a look at the Hyperion bots from Borderlands 2. So have a look at the legs. It just looks like a bundle of wires. Of course, it's not supposed to make too much sense because the player isn't supposed to be looking at the robot from up close. Instead, they're supposed to be standing quite far away and shooting at their weak spots. So in this case, we could say that the artist leant further towards form than function, making the robots look nice rather than realistic. And it's not like that's a good or a bad thing, because in this case, they were created for a video game following an artistic style, and it works really well. In fact, all of the bots in that game fit really well, because they comply to the semi-cartoony style of the Borderlands universe. So that's the point I want to get across here. It really doesn't matter if what you're making is realistic or not. Really the only measure of success is whether or not your design achieves the purpose you set out to accomplish from the beginning. It's not really appropriate to properly compare artwork and designs that set out to achieve completely different end goals. For example, of course video game characters are going to lean towards a stylized and often unrealistic form, whereas robotics engineers are going to lean heavily towards realistic physical functionality. But that may not always be the case depending on the art style and the end goal. So moving on, let's talk about implied functionality. Implied functionality is where we trick the viewer into thinking that the object is in some way functional, even if it's not. For example, as we'll see in the next video, placing a ball joint and some pneumatics on a robot arm could trick the viewer into visualizing which way the arm should bend, even if on closer inspection, nothing is really connected and the object would likely just fall apart in real life. For the context of concepting robotics for entertainment mediums like films and games, we could say that it doesn't actually need to function, rather it just needs to look like it functions. The rest will be done through animation trickery. But now we're going to move on to something a little bit more theoretical that people don't often talk about in tutorials related to hard surface designs, and that's evolutionary inspiration. As consumers of the world that's been built around us, we don't often notice the symmetry in forms or the recursion of evolutionary solutions to environmental problems. So carry this idea with you. 99% of the robotic designs that you'll bump into will be made to look like humans or features of the human body or failing that animals or features of animal bodies. 
Even our industrial robot arms typically share the same number of axes as our own arms. But why? Because evolution has already solved some of the mechanical issues we have faced in the modern era, and we expend effort in taking inspiration from those solutions and pushing them further. In a roundabout and unrealistic way, we could say this is how engineers turn birds into commercial airliners. Now, articulation has evolved in a number of ways over the lifespan of the planet, as has various kinds of sensory processing. For example, the eye, a mechanism for taking in and focusing light, has developed separately on multiple occasions. This tells us that evolution has a bias towards certain features, and we could rightly expect that alien life elsewhere in the universe would share such similarities. Put simply, there's a bias for ways to sense the environment and ways to manipulate the environment for the sake of increasing the chances of survival. Our bodies have proved one of the best at manipulating the world, which is in part why we take such inspiration from it when designing things like robotics. That, and of course ego and personification, mixed with a subtle desire to create life in our own image. Anyway, to pull it back a bit, the point I'm making is that evolution is a gold mine for inspiration in terms of sensory and manipulation techniques. If you want to make a robot that runs at incredible speeds on land, then all you need to do is copy a cheetah. If you want to make one that glides through the air, then copy a type of bird. If you want to make a multi-purpose tool using being that's good at endurance movement with high degrees of articulation, then copy a human. Okay, so let's step away from theory a bit and move towards more practicality. In some previous videos, I have mentioned the usefulness of having a collection of kit bash pieces to assist with rapid prototyping of concepts, as well as how you need to be cautious of consigning yourself to the specific style that those pieces present. In this case, however, I would say that if you're going to build robotics, you would be shooting yourself in the foot if you didn't build a collection of fundamental joints and transition pieces to start with. Having a collection of joints is useful for prototyping through the means of informed kit bashing. Now when I say informed kit bashing, what I mean is when the parts you place inform where others should go and what sort of function they would have, as opposed to uninformed kit bashing where parts are randomly thrown together without much thought, primarily for the sake of detailing. When in doubt about the direction of your robotic structure, universal joints are a viable solution because they provide a lot of angular freedom. However, they are not always a perfect solution and come with limitations of their own. For example, they are not a constant velocity joint, which means their velocity will change during rotation, making them not ideal for transferring rotary motion. But this is not something we have to worry about if we are designing for unrealistic purposes such as entertainment. If you pick up the resources for this series on ArtStation, then you'll see that I have included some template kit batch objects for joints that you could use to help inform designs of your own. I've tried to keep them as style agnostic as possible, so you should be able to use them anywhere without having to worry about them conflicting with other styles. So what we're going to do over the next few videos is create a couple of robot arm designs with different purposes for demonstration. First of all, we will create one that prioritizes form over function, where we will put more effort into making it look cool rather than making it functional or easy to animate. And for the second one, we will flip that around and put most of the effort into making it functional, poseable and easy to animate, or consequently dialing down on the cool factor to make it a bit less abstract and detailed. Now just to be completely clear, just because something looks cool, it doesn't mean it can't be functional as well. On the contrary, in the last video, we will take a look at exactly this, how to balance form and function to create something that both looks cool and is functional enough for things like posing and animation. Now just before we wrap this video up, I'm going to tell you what paid plugins I'm using with Blender. The version of Blender used for the modeling in this series is 2.79, and I'm making use of the hard ops and box cutter plugins. As well as this, I also have Decal Machine and Mesh Machine installed, which are super useful for enhancing hard surface workflows. However, I'm not making much use of them in this particular series. For the lighting, I'm making some use of the Gaffer plugin because it provides some easily accessible controls for controlling properties of HDRIs. One of the most useful free plugins I use that comes packaged with Blender is Loop Tools, and I highly recommend that you check that out if you haven't already. And for a final side note, the support for the development of Blender 2.8 has been steadily growing, which is nice to see. If you want to see some of the cool things that the community have been doing with it, then Claire Balexandrov put together a nice video a couple of weeks ago showing off some of the real-time demos. Demos. There's one video in particular that's really cool by Daniel Bystead where they break down their Goodnight Claire demo. It's definitely worth a watch since they do a really good job at showing off some of Eevee's features. I'll leave links in the description. So with that being said, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and ring that bell. And I'll see you in part two where we will begin modeling.